you meditate, it's like running a series of experiments on the mind, trying to see what happens when you focus it on one thing for long periods of time. trying to see what happens when you really take seriously the idea that maybe what you're doing with your mind is causing unnecessary suffering. So you want to see clearly what you're doing, where the suffering is, what you can change. And so it's important that you try to get accurate results from the experiment. And as with any experiment, it's important that, in fact, one of the basic things, it's so basic we hardly even think about it. You don't want the scientists to be starving. If they're starving, they'll eat up the endowment before it even gets to the experiment. Or they'll fudge the results to get quick results so they can print them and get a name for themselves. Or if they're really starving. Say the experiment involves feeding bananas to apes, the scientists will eat up the bananas first and never get to the apes. What this means as a meditator is you have to come into the meditation with a sense of well-being. This is why the path doesn't begin with meditation. It begins with generosity. It begins with virtue. Because it's through the practice of generosity and virtue that you gain a sense of self-esteem. You see the good that comes from being able to give things away, and that in and of itself gives the mind a sense of wealth. Generosity is said to be one of the forms of noble wealth. It gives a mind a sense of contentment. You're not constantly gobbling up your profits. You take something and take part of it and share the rest. And that gives a different kind of wealth inside. The same with virtue. You see there are certain things that you could do that might get you an immediate advantage over somebody else, but you realize that you'd rather not do them because they're harmful, not only to the other person but also to yourself. And as you learn how to say no to yourself more and more consistently in situations like that, you can begin to trust yourself. And as your precepts, as your virtues get tested in more and more difficult situations, you get a greater and greater sense of their worth. If someone draw for you a thousand dollars to to lie, you realize you have a precept that's worth more than a thousand dollars. They offer a million dollars, and you still can say no. Okay, you've got a precept that's worth more than a million. And you learn a lot of other skills as well in the course of practicing generosity and virtue. For one thing, you learn a sense of de deferred gratification, realizing that there are solid pleasures to be gained from putting aside or foregoing quick and easy pleasures that end quickly and easily as well. You gain a sense of responsibility, a sense of deferred gratification, a sense of self-worth, a sense that you can trust yourself. This turns into, translates into a sense of inner wealth, inner well-being. This is what you want to bring to the meditation. So you can watch what's happening in the mind with a sense of dispassion. Bad things come up in the meditation and you don't get worked up over them. Good things come up and you don't grab at them. You can watch them instead of saying, wow, this must be something really great, and you grab it and it's gone. It's like a woman I once knew in Thailand. She was new to meditation, and she lived in the neighborhood, and I'd gotten to know her over time, and she was pretty mercenary. 
And sure enough, one day she was sitting and meditating, and all of a sudden she reached out in front of her and grabbed the air, fell over. And she later admitted very sheepishly that she had saw a vision of a golden tray coming to float at her, floating right in front of her. She wanted it. This is what happens when you meditate with a sense of hunger. You grab at everything that comes by and you end up finding it just slips through your fingers. You destroy whatever it was. So try to come with a sense of wealth, that you're not hungry for things. So when something good comes up, you can just watch it for a while and say, okay, what is this? Is this something really good or not? If you can develop the sense of patience to watch things, then you begin to, on the one hand, get a better sense of what's worthwhile, and two, when something really good does come, you can just watch it for a while and not try to gobble it up right away. And even when you can maintain a particular state, you don't want to start jumping to conclusions about it. That's like the scientists who get a little bit of a results in their experiment and are in a great hurry to publish the results so they can make a name for themselves. Something comes up in the meditation, you're not too quick to interpret it. Just watch it for a while, see what happens. What good does it do for the mind? Because this is what all the good things in the meditation are about, is what good can they do for you? We're not here to hoard up the jhanas the way you would hoard up houses on Baltic or Ventnor. When something comes, just watch it for a while, stick with it, see what it does. How is it useful in the practice? And John Freud once pointed out that there are even states of wrong concentration that can be useful. You get yourself in states of concentration where you totally lose any sense of the body. You have strong states of concentration, not that kind of floating concentration where you just kind of lose your bearings. But you really focus on very minute spot, and you just refuse to deal with anything that comes in through any of the senses. And what happens, you can blank yourself out totally. You lose sense of the body. You can't even hear anything. And you can stay there for long periods of time. If you make up your mind beforehand you're going to stay for two hours, you'll stay for two hours. Come, back, come out immediately, right on target. Two hours will seem like two minutes. And it's wrong concentration, because there's no way you're going to be able to develop any insight while you're in that state. But it has its uses. As John Fu once said, he had to go a, into surgery one time. They're going to remove a kidney. He didn't trust the anesthesiologist, so he put himself in this state, so that no matter what happened, he wouldn't have to suffer pain. So even wrong concentration can have its uses. All the more so with right concentration. But even right concentration, as I said, it's not something that you focus on as an end in and of itself. It's part of a path. And the path is worthwhile because it takes you to where you want to go. So whatever it is that comes up in the mind, just put a post-it note on it saying, this seems to be X, and then watch it for a while to see what X does. And maybe after a while, as you get more and more familiar with the train of the mind, you have to shift the post-it notes around. But you haven't lost anything, because you've learned what these states are useful for. This is why you want to come to the meditation with a sense of well-being. Try to keep the mind on an even keel, so that no matter what happens, good or bad, the mind doesn't have to go up with the good things or down with the bad. It can watch and say, okay, this is good. Where did it come from? If it's good, where is it going to go? If the mind is scattered, ask yourself, where did this come from? Try to trace it out. Try to understand what's happening in terms of cause and effect. And that requires that the mood not totally take possession of your mind. Try to keep a sense of the observer that's 
watching the mood come and go. Of course, that observer itself has to have its own, its own mood, which is a mood of patience, a mood of well-being, but also a sense of urgency, that you know, this is important work that we're doing here. We don't want to suffer. So it's important that you strike the right balance there. You want to get accurate results. Sometimes that takes time. So you're willing to take time. The idea being that when you finally publish your results, they really are worthwhile. They really are dependable, rather than being just a flash in the pan. So try to bring a sense of contentment, a sense of well-being to the meditation. Develop attitudes of generosity and virtue, self-restraint. Practice them in your daily life. And try to get a keen sense for the rewards that come, the sense of well-being. The sense of inner wealth that comes when you know that you can give things away, you can abstain from what you know are harmful actions. No matter how, how much you'd like to do them, you just don't do them. And you build that sense of inner worth and inner wealth. That puts you in a position where, as you watch your mind in the course of the meditation, you're really going to see what's happening. You're not going to eat up the endowment. You're not going to eat the bananas all up before they can get to the chimps. And you're going to wait until your results are solid and sure before you try to publish anything. That's when the experiment really will be a gift of knowledge, both to yourself and everybody else. <laughs>